our esteemed panel of guests. My name is Rehan Udin. I'm a journalist at Middle East Eye, and I'll be hosting today's discussion on the political and social climate in Saudi Arabia. So just to give you a quick introduction into the topic, um, Saudi Arabia somewhat shocked the world in late February when it announced that it was suspending the Umrah pilgrimage, an Islamic religious pilgrimage to the holy cities of Mecca and Medina, uh, which over 7 million Muslims from around the world perform each year. That measure was actually taken before um, Saudi Arabia had confirmed um, any cases of the coronavirus. It was taken uh, as a precautionary measure. Um, but since then, uh, the country has been in partial lockdown and it's now confirmed around 90,000 coronavirus cases um, and about four, 549 deaths from the virus. And beyond just the health impact, um, the coronavirus has also led in part to a global oil crisis. Um, at one point in April, um, the price of crude oil in the US was actually in negative territory. People were paying to get rid of oil because um, storage space was running out. And unsurprisingly, that's had a really major impact on Saudi Arabia, which is comfortably the world's biggest oil exporter. Um, the crisis has plundered Saudi's economy and has now added to its growing public debt. So amid all this chaos, what is the current political and social climate in Saudi Arabia? How do young Saudis feel about their future prospects? Where does the crisis leave the young crown prince and, and his military objectives? Do Saudis support MBS's policies and, and is there scope for them to speak out? With me to discuss all these questions and more questions, I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Madawi Al-Rashid, by Yahya Asiri, uh, and by David Hurst. Um, I'll be asking them some questions, but I'll also be taking some questions from you, the audience. And it's not too late now to submit your questions. So if you're on Facebook watching this live, you can comment below the video uh, with any questions you'd like to ask our panelists. Um, and if you're on Twitter, you can either use the hashtag MEE talking point or you can just tweet at Middle East Eye um, and let us know and you'll have your chance to ask um, your questions to the panelists. Um, before we start the discussion, I'll just give a quick um, background into our speakers. Um, so first off, um, Madawi Al-Rashid is an academic and a writer. She's a visiting professor at the London School of Economics Middle East Centre. I'm actually a former undergraduate at the LSE, so it's always a pleasure to be uh, in the company of a fellow member of the LSE community. Um, Madawi grew up in Saudi Arabia, in Lebanon and in the UK, uh, where she received a PhD from Cambridge University. Um, since then, she's written extensively about gender, history, politics and religion in Saudi Arabia. And her latest book, The Sun King, uh, looks at how reform and repression go hand in hand in Mohammed bin Salman, Saudi Arabia, and that will be published later this year. Welcome, and thank you very much for joining us, Madawi. Thank you. Uh, we're also joined by Yahya Asiri, uh, a Saudi human rights activist. Yahya was born and grew up in Saudi Arabia, uh, where he became a member of the Saudi Royal Air Force. Um, he now lives uh, and is based in London um, and has a master's degree in human rights and political communication from Kingston University. Um, he is the founder and head of al -Qist, a human rights organization which monitors and documents rights abuses in Saudi Arabia. So welcome, Yahya. We're really looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. And finally, uh, we're joined by David Hurst. Um, David has spent over three decades as a journalist covering international affairs, previously at The Guardian, and now as the editor-in-chief of Middle East Eye, where he writes about the whole of the Middle East and North Africa region, including extensive coverage of the politics of Saudi Arabia. Um, David will be partly a panelist, but hopefully he'll also be giving me a hand um, in asking questions um, to Madawi and to Yahya. So welcome along, David. Delighted to be here. Um, David, I, I actually want to, um, to kick off the discussion with you. 
Um, so can you give us a little bit of background into how exactly the coronavirus uh, pandemic has impacted Saudi Arabia so far? What, what's been the scale of the outbreak? Have there been any particular hotspots? Have there been any senior figures who have contracted it? Can you, can you just give us a bit of background? Well, um, again, uh, I hesitate to, to say how uh, things have developed in Saudi Arabia when our own government, the British government, uh, has consistently lied about the spread of the virus uh, in, in care homes. And so we all have uh, this problem. I suppose the difference in Britain is that eventually the truth comes out um, and the government is subject to a huge amount of criticism about the accuracy of its statistics. And in Saudi Arabia, it doesn't. Um, so although the figures in Saudi Arabia look uh, extremely low, 549 deaths and only about 90,000 uh, cases, the actual reality uh, is in fact very, very difficult to, um, to ascertain because they simply don't receive people in hospitals or they cover it up. Um, according to three senior Saudi medical sources that I talked to at least, uh, nearly 70% of Mecca's uh, population of 2 million residents are estimated to be carriers of the virus. And they, they work that out through a, a random test. Um, another source uh, I talked to said that the actual spread of the disease could be three to four times higher than the declared one. And they're expecting the, the, um, the, the virus to peak sometime in June. Um, we have other odd glimpses of what's actually happening in, in, in the kingdom. Uh, we had sources inside the Royal Hospital. This is the, this is the King Faisal Hospital in Riyadh, a section of, wing, of which is known as the VIP wing. And uh, they treat members of the royal family. Now, uh, there were various stories that came from that particular uh, source, and that was... Uh, one that an anaesthetist in the hospital had fallen in ill and they actually had to close all uh, um, uh, non-urgent cases. So, so even though the whole medical procedure was disrupted by, uh, by, by the virus uh, initially, uh, then came reports that members of the Saudi royal family had actually been infected uh, themselves. Uh, latterly, the New York Times they carried a report that maybe 150 um, members of the royal family had been infected. And we have other sources saying that the scale of the disease is such that they've had to actually stop um, simply uh, the public hospitals have been overwhelmed and they're now turning to private hospitals to, uh, to take COVID-19 patients. So these are just glimpses of from medical sources, again, all anonymous, uh, again, all, all, all off the record. Um, the kingdom itself has reacted to, for instance, the New York Times report uh, by saying, uh, by wheeling out uh, Prince Turki bin Faisal al Saud, who is a Saudi royal and former intelligence chief for whom uh, uh, Jamal Khashoggi worked uh, for a time. And he dismissed this, uh, dismissed the New York Times uh, report denying that 150 royals had, been, had caught the virus and accusing the paper of spreading misinformation, saying the true number was less than 20. So again, it's all part of the, the whole COVID-19 uh, saga is all part of the um, misinformation or information war that, that seems to, to affect anything uh, in, involving the truth when it comes to Saudi Arabia. But let's suffice it to say they have a real problem um, and um, uh, and it's not going away. Thank you, David. Um, staying on the topic of, of, of the pandemic, um, Madawi, I'd, I'd like to come to you. Um, the pandemic has been financially quite costly, not just for Saudi Arabia, but, but for many countries in the world with, with lockdowns, with entire industries like the tourism industry, hospitality, entertainment, all these things kind of closing down. Um, governments are having to kind of step in, um, but someone eventually will have to pay for, for, for these measures. And in the case of Saudi Arabia, we've seen um, VAT has tripled from 5% to 15%. Uh, and the monthly cost of living allowance for state employees of around um, $250. Um, we've seen that that's been 
um, suspended. Um, on that topic, we've we've received. I'm going to start straight away with a question we've received on social media um, from Faisal in Saudi Arabia. He wants to ask you, um, given that the VAT tax is a sales tax that is regressive in its nature, uh, which means to say that those that will be affected are mostly among the poorest Saudis, uh, and given that cuts in government spending will likely reduce the availability of jobs, how do you think middle class and working class Saudis will react? Yes, hello. Um... I'm delighted to join this conversation to uh, throw some light on the topics that you raised. Um, I think, um, as we know, yes, all governments are uh, dealing with an unusual situation, but Saudi Arabia has its own issues. And the first one is the so-called reforms, whether they are economic, social, uh, um, um, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, all dependent on uh, being in a globalized world as we knew it. So if you want to diversify the economy and uh, introduce tourism, you need people to be able to travel. If you need um, uh, somebody to invest in your economy, you need investors to have faith in your ability and your potential. Uh, now, when it comes to Saudi Arabia, if, if we have seen that both of these issues um, cannot be fulfilled under the present pandemic and the crisis. The second point I want to mention is we have seen around the globe that governments don't even have oil resources that match those of Saudi Arabia, trying to cushion their citizens and the most vulnerable in their communities and countries from the impact on um, you know, uh, unemployment, uh, uh, you know, the quarantine. Um, and we have seen this in Britain, in France, and in other countries. So while governments in the world are, are trying to protect their citizens and protect their economies from total collapse, we see the Saudi government actually imposing extra taxes on, on the population and depriving those who depend on a state allowance during times when food prices and all you know, retail, everything, has, uh, the price has gone up. It's depriving them of that, which is really interesting given that Saudi, the Saudi economy and the Saudi ability to protect itself is in theory huge given its previous resources and oil wealth. So the uh, crown prince chose the moment of weakness, of pandemic, of hardship that has fallen on the population to announce through his minister uh, of finance the introduction of new taxes. Even Britain, that has a, a serious economic problem at the moment, I don't think the prime minister would dare mention the word taxes or increasing the taxes until probably after the pandemic is over. But this is a, contra a contrast that it is very difficult to explain to people, given the resources of Saudi Arabia, its previous oil wealth. And if we want to find an explanation, we only have to focus on how the leadership at the moment wants the population to pay the price for its mismanagement of the economy uh, that had taken place for uh, several years and became more acute since 2017 when Mohammed bin Salman became crown prince. Do you think, um, based on what you've said, are, are there any signs on the ground of, of any dissent to these um, new policies that have been announced? Are, are young Saudis worried about their future prospects? Well, they're definitely worried. However, the expression of worry is not always obvious to outsiders, simply because we are talking about a country that not, doesn't allow any kind of uh, freedom of expression. It doesn't allow people to voice critical opinions uh, in social media or the traditional media. 
there is no opposition, there's no accountability inside, inside the country. There is nobody who could stand up and question the new measures introduced, whether it's VAT or you know, suspending the uh, state allowance. So the, the, we are in the dark, but the worrying thing is all these kind of issues are hotly debated uh, in the privacy of homes and among close friends and family, but they are not finding expression inside the country simply because the cost that, that, that people will pay a high price for voicing a simple question or critical opinion. And it is very difficult therefore to measure or to describe what the situation is among people now or how it will be after um, uh, the, uh, the pandemic passes. And, and Madawi, do, do you think um, among Saudi royals, um, there's, there's been a lot of reports about them living quite lavish lifestyles, reports of them owning very expensive cars and homes and going on luxurious holidays in Europe. Do, do you think we'll see that change with the pandemic? Um, you know, the inequality that, that kind of has been mentioned, surely when, when people are going through austerity, will the people at the top have to go through austerity as well? I doubt it. Um, now, if you're talking about this small um, uh, privileged group, we're talking about uh, uh, probably more than 15,000 princes and princesses and children who receive monthly salaries from uh, the government. And nobody knows or nobody can give you a figure uh, with regard to how much uh, this cost the public purse, the, the, the salaries and the benefits of those people don't come in any budget. They do not feature in any kind of document. And there's no parliament, no elected government to ask, why are they given these incredible sums, monthly salaries, most of them are idle princes sitting in their palaces uh, enjoying the, the sort of, you know, the luxury of, of uh, this life. Um, and it is very difficult to see that they will change their behavior. So when the announcement was made uh, about the VAT and the 1,000 Saudi riyal, it's just under $300, that the government can't afford now to give the state employees, but there was no mention of cutting the salaries uh, uh, of, of those uh, princes. And they have accumulated a lot of wealth, not only through monthly salaries, but also through land that they were given, that they could trade, sell, etc. the privileges they had. And therefore, people would look and see that those are not affected by any of the austerity measures that the, the government forecasted just a month ago, um, and they will continue. Now, I do remember an incident when the, uh, I think it was King Abdullah who suspended the subsidy on electricity bills. And of course, the, the, the big palaces that consume a lot of electricity and water, um, they, they went to the king to object that their electricity bills are are going to be uh, so high now. But if you think about, you know, those people who are government employees or the general middle class or the others who are not middle class, who are not working in the government, they are going to suffer as a result. But there was no mention last month of any measure whatsoever that would limit government spending on those idle princes. And it is very difficult to see how uh, uh, Mohammed bin Salman had antagonized and marginalized and actually robbed some of them of their wealth. But I mean, we, there is no like worry about that. It is almost like thieves among themselves fighting over uh, a cake which was sliced previously and is continuing to be sliced and distributed among the new, uh, a new coterie of princes. 
Um, and so therefore, it is a, a war that had started between the princes over not only economic uh, wealth and privileges, but also political rivalry. And it is their problem, and it is their uh, internal uh, uh, crisis that people feel completely dissociated from. It's not about them. It's about those who had enjoyed privilege before for so many decades. And now Mohammed bin Salman want to purge them. So let them purge each other. Nothing is going to benefit the, your usual um, citizen who is living of a salary at the end of the month in a government bureaucracy. Yeah, here you have the, um, just to pick up on uh, Madawi's point, um, previous kings have been able to buy their way out of trouble uh, as far, uh, there was the one king basically uh, funded foreign bursaries abroad and was very popular for doing that and then they had to cut it. What is the effect? We both know that uh, the Saudi economy has been declining from, from a very high point quite quickly before the coronavirus hit. What will be the effect socially of uh, uh, Mohammed bin Salman not being able to buy his way out of uh, trouble uh, as far as the Saudi population is concerned? Okay, regarding to the, uh, the Saudi society, the concern that uh, the big issue at this moment, they are not able to speak on, we are not able to analyze what's going on exactly inside the country, basically, because the only allow uh, voices or narrative is the narrative from the government. And uh, for that, they are really struggling, not just financially, but also with the, the coronavirus, with uh, the pandemic, with everything around and with the repression. At the same time, uh, for us outside the country, it's so difficult to measure everything's going on. We try, uh, we are trying to cover up what's going on inside, what, what we are seeing, it's just limited. It's not all the reality. Uh, also, for example, if I give you an example, yesterday they arrested uh, someone who was active in uh, basically because he uh, filmed a uh, supermarket without bread. He said, there's no bread in the supermarket and they arrested him. And I, I can remember at the moment, there is a lot of journalists, they visited Saudi Arabia and they wrote something uh, positive in favor of the regime and or for MBS. And they talked about reform and people they are uh, happy about what's going on in Saudi Arabia. When I, when I talked to them and I asked them why they wrote that, is that part of the PR? Uh, some of them, they replied to me, uh, no, uh, we visited Saudi Arabia, people they are happy and everyone in, in the street were when we ask anyone or when we interview anyone in the street, uh, they told us they are happy and they are, uh, there's no anger and we have not seen anyone protest or anyone uh, disagree with Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, basically, they will see because the only choice is to charm MBS and the government. If you say anything different, that will, will put you in real trouble. And for that, uh, everything, uh, uh, inside the country is, mu uh, is must be matched with the narrative and the story from the government. Otherwise, they will be faced the repression. There is lots of anger inside the society, especially the young generation, but they can't, they can't express the, 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 their anger because of the repression from the regime. On that topic, actually, um, we've, we've just received a message um, on Facebook uh, underneath this live video from someone in Riyadh um, who says that they want to share this um, this video on their Facebook page with a following of about 50 friends, but can't do so out of fear of paying the price. So exactly what you guys have mentioned and, and we're, we're seeing it. Um, and I'm sure that there's, there's probably others. Um, yeah, yeah, I wanted to move on to another topic, um, onto the, the military. Um, Saudi Arabia is the fifth biggest spender overall on military and the highest spender per capita. Um, a lot of that spending at the moment is going on Yemen, uh, where a Saudi-led coalition um, has been involved since 2015 in one of the deadliest and most devastating conflicts in recent history. Will, will this um, coronavirus crisis and, and the financial crisis that has resulted from it have any impact on MBS's military objectives? 
I don't see anything yet, but I believe that will affect especially, it's not just financially issues, but it's uh, the issue with the, the war in Yemen, it's uh, become more serious with these days uh, after the, uh, the war crimes uh, committed in Yemen. Uh, so there is a lot of issues facing Mohammed bin Salman with the war in Yemen, uh, the financial issues, the coronavirus, and the pressure coming from uh, outside. Uh, we know uh, countries, they are uh, selling weapons to Saudi Arabia. They are not selling weapons uh, just as uh, uh, to sell the weapons. It's, it's uh, kind of corruption between these countries because Mohammed bin Salman and Saudi Arabia, they want to build allies with the Western governments and the, the powerful governments around the world uh, and to build good allies with them. They are paying money and to pay the money, they can't pay bribes. Uh, immediately. So they are uh, uh, buying uh, weapons. And for that, it's clear, for example, when we uh, listen to Donald Trump, and he, when he's talking about Saudi Arabia, and he said they are uh, guarantee lots of jobs for us, and there's lots of jobs uh, coming from Saudi Arabia. Uh, that's because uh, the contract has become like bribes, like in, uh, but at the moment, there is lots of trials in Europe and around the world about the uh, about, uh, uh, arms deals for Saudi Arabia. For example, in Spain, they found out there is, uh, or at least there is a trial at the moment for bribes and corruption uh, during the uh, last 30, uh, 30 years. And they are, it's under uh, not just investigation, but it's uh, uh, in front of the, of the courts at the moment. Also, there is a trial here for uh, the British government and also for the BAE system. Uh, it's uh, at the moment, uh, the trial is going on at the moment and that will, uh, limitate the opportunity for the British government to keep uh, selling the weapons to Saudi Arabia. Also, we have uh, German last few months, they ex extend uh, the ban uh, for new contracts, uh, new arms for Saudi Arabia. And the, uh, all of these things, that will limitate the ability for Saudi Arabia to continue this war. And also, uh, Saudi Arabia, they always saying, uh, if there is uh, some bans or some difficulties with the Western allies, we can choose another allies. We can go to Russia or China. And this is completely, in reality, this is so difficult and they can't do it in one day because building uh, building like a, a system in Saudi Arabia or with the weapons does take very, very long years. Uh, I remember the contract with the uh, BAE and the British government for the, for the Typhoon, the Eurofighter, it started in 2006, but they have not got the aircraft until 2012. And uh, they already have contracts with the uh, British government and with the BAE, with the Al Yamama contract and with the Ternado aircraft. So they already have the uh, contracts with them. But they found it so difficult to start a new contract because these, uh, these things, it's taking very, very long time. So to swift or to change from uh, West to you know from the United States and Europe to Russia and China is not something easy to uh, to do it. But Saudi Arabia they are trying to tell the the world please don't try to pressure us with the war in Yemen because there is a money and we can pay the money for other people. But in reality, it's so difficult. I hope all of these difficulties will end up to finish out to end the, uh, the war in Yemen. And, and how do you think um, the Saudi army feel about the direction it's going under MBS? Are you aware of any, any kind of dissatisfaction among the Saudi military? There were, there yes. Were, uh, to follow up on that, there were reports that it was extremely, uh, uh, the, the actual service in Yemen for, for Saudi officers was, was, was really unpopular. And people were trying to do everything they could to, to avoid actually fighting there. Yes, uh, exactly. In, uh, in the war in Yemen, lots of people, especially the pilots and uh, also the army in Saudi Arabia, they feel that they are, they are fighting in the wrong place and they are fighting uh, innocent people. Uh, they announced the war, they said, against Iran, against al Houthi, and uh, actually it's against Al-Yemen. They destroyed Al-Yemen and uh, Al-Yemen moment regarding to the United Nations, not re regarding to us. It is the worst crisis in the world at the moment. And this is uh, people inside Saudi Arabia, they feel it and they, they, they know it and they, uh, our people, they are not happy to uh, continue with that. I remember in 2009, 
uh, I was still in, in the airport, but at that time I was outside of the country. Uh, when I traveled back to Saudi Arabia, I spoke with some uh, pilots and they told me about when they missiled villages and schools and uh, places they ordered to uh, missile it from, from the operation room. And they told me how they, uh, they feel and how they are feel sorry about it and they feel guilty about it. But it is so difficult for Saudi pilot or to Saudi officer to say, no, I am not going to this war because regarding to the Saudi system, they will go to execute them. And actually in ethical view, uh, we will say to face the death penalty, it's much better to kill the uh, innocent people. Uh, uh, just refuse it and go to the uh, to face the execution rather than to kill the, the innocent. Uh, but this is in theory, this is something eth uh, ethical, but not everyone can do that. It's very difficult to do it and they will find justification from the religious people working with the Wahhabism scholars uh, to say okay you are uh, in uh, uh, in the war to defend your country and uh, you have the uh, religious justifications so they will try to find some window to protect themselves from the penalty that will come if they refuse uh, but in at the end they are fighting uh, with people they believe it is the wrong place the wrong people, and it's uh, uh, the decision taken by the wrong person as well. They know Mohammed bin Salman, he's not capable to take such a decision. Uh, there, uh, they are not willing to continue this war, and we can see that this is very clear uh, in this war. The military and the army, uh, they are trying their uh, best, most of them at least, uh, to end this war and to get rid of this war. Uh, but unfortunately, the decision maker, not the society and not the officers, not the military, the decision maker is Mohammed bin Salman. He's not paying price yet. Uh, and for that, we are calling for the international pressure for, in Mohammed bin Salman to make him pay the price. Uh, until now, if there is any missiles coming to Saudi Arabia, even to the, uh, to, uh, the our oil, to Aramco or to Abha, Khamis, uh, Riyadh, anywhere, Mohammed bin Salman, until now, he, he has not feel the pain yet uh, because he's still using the money in his interest. He's still using everything in his PR. Uh, he's still uh, not understanding what's going on in Yemen. He took the decision and he said uh, the war will finish with two weeks and people, they heard that. And now we exceeded five years and uh, al Houthi is stronger than any time before. And people at the moment in Yemen, they become more uh, accepting al Houthi than any time before because they believe al Houthi is against uh, foreigners destroying their country. So in the past, it was war between Yemenis. At the moment, it's, it's most of the Yemenis, they are supporting uh, al Houthi unless if they are pay, uh, paid by Saudi Arabia or by UAE. Thank, thank you, yeah, yeah. Um, David, if I can turn back to you, um, we mentioned earlier about um, oil prices. I just wanted to explore that a little bit more. How did a public health crisis, a pandemic, um, translate into an oil crisis? And, and, and what was Saudi Arabia's involvement in that? Well, uh, the economy was, again, from quite a high place. Um, it's not a poor country. Um, and it had uh, very healthy foreign reserves. Uh, it also had a very healthy um, public investment fund, um, PIF, a sovereign wealth fund. But from high points, um, money has been draining out of this very, very quickly. And the latest saga is uh, that basically what Saudi Arabia does is rob Peter to pay Paul. They're taking money from one fund and putting it in another and claiming they've got the money for that. It's like double counting. So what happened very recently was that Saudi Arabia transferred uh, 150 billion rials, which is about $40 billion from the central bank foreign reserves, which are themselves falling by nearly $27 billion month on month um, to pay for a new buying spree from the Sovereign Wealth Fund. They're buying up Disney, they're buying up uh, 
quite a lot of oil reserves actually, uh, which is curious strategy for a country that's supposed to be divesting itself from oil. Um, but this is not new money, right? So they're literally, it's, it's, it's like transferring from one bank account to, to, to another. But the total picture is that both funds are declining, um, not uh, increasing. Now, again, the PIF is doing the same thing that all other sovereign wealth funds in the Gulf are doing, and that is buying cheap, uh, buying low. Uh, you know, the prices of, of BP, the price of Disney, the price of, of uh, Boeing, for instance, uh, which have been slammed uh, both by, 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 by the grounding of their latest aircraft, but also now by the lack of foreign travel and the halt of all foreign travel, basically. Uh, it's very cheap. And so if you buy shares now, presumably in nine months time, uh, 10 months time, you're gonna get a very healthy return. That's what everyone else is doing. But um, Saudi Arabia's investments uh, have not uh, worked out. Um, and these are gambles, these are bets. Uh, they bought into SoftBank um, uh, just at the point at which uh, uh, SoftBank, uh, a, a very big fund in SoftBank, uh, uh, went well, not belly up, but went, uh, but has had a, a 16 billion uh, pound uh, dollar loss. Um, they they bought into Uber. They bought into uh, uh, and then and the, the price of Uber went down. So they they they, they made punts which were ill judged. Um, and, the, and the feeling is that um, the fund is not being managed well uh, and foreign investors are, uh, are scratching their heads at, at, at how the fund is being managed. Of course, what we know is really is happening is that Mohammed bin Salman has too much of a say in, 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 in what the fund does. It doesn't have enough autonomy, it doesn't have enough expertise. The system of governance is, uh, is wrong. And so it is squandering its money uh, uh, like everyone else. It's coming from a high point, but these, so the, the you know, we're, we're, although it's bizarre to say this, so we're going to have to think of Saudi as a net debtor country. Um, it can obviously afford the debt, um, uh, the largest oil, oil export has slipped into a, a 9 billion budget deficit in the first quarter as the oil revenue has collapsed. But the short answer to a question is that things were going wrong with the Saudi economy before the virus hit. The virus has just accelerated that sort of financial slide. It's not a collapse, but it's certainly a slide. And in terms of uh, raising funds for, for that public investment fund, um, shortly before the pandemic, um, Saudi Arabia announced uh, the world's largest public offering um, when it decided to sell shares in the oil company Aramco, which is often referred to as the world's most profitable company. With everything that's that's happened since then, it, is that strategy essentially dead in the water? Is it, is it still relevant now? Well, I think I'd, I'd like to ask Madawi as, as well about 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 the reform program. But just to answer that 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 particular part of that question. Uh, the Aramco IPO was originally proposed in, in 2018. Um, that was the very year, in fact, that uh, MBS decided to brutally murder Jamal Khashoggi, um, a Washington-based uh, Saudi uh, economist. I mean, it's about, forget the ethics or morality, or let's say we're dealing with the Borgia family um, uh, or Machiavelli, in fact, um, uh, MBS has read a copy of, of, of Machiavelli's The Prince. But be that aside, um, um, uh, you wouldn't do that if you were going to launch in the same year uh, the world's biggest IPO. Um, so what happened then was the, it was delayed. Plans were revived uh, last year. And then there came a really quite... Um, interesting series of moves which were not reported by us but they were reported again by the New York Times which has done lots of good stuff on this. Um, there were two days of meetings they reported in September the 3rd and the 4th when international banks gathered uh, at, at uh, Aramco's London offices to pitch 
the company for roles in the in, in the underwriting team. And that whole relationship fell apart when their valuation of Aramco was substantially less than Mohammed bin Salman's preferred Aram, uh, uh, valuation. What the international banks were saying was that Aramco is worth between um, uh, 1.1 and 1.7 uh, trillion. And um, um, the, uh, the uh, Saudi regime wanted uh, a, a valuation of two trillion. Um, and so what happened was that um, uh, the IPO fell apart internationally. Uh, there, was, there was no buying or selling of shares in London or in New York. Uh, it was the money was raised uh, locally in Riyadh, um, and again robbing Peter to pay Paul. This wasn't outside money. Uh, the the money they expected to raise from that sale was twenty five uh, billion dollars from the same people who were in the, the shakedown uh, uh, in 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 the luxury hotels in in. Um, in Riyadh, uh, they were robbed again, um, and this was only a fraction of the hundred billion dollars that uh, Prince Mohammed had or originally uh, uh, envisaged. So again, failure. Um, so what we see with uh, the, the the pattern of these decisions is very quickly made, very reckless decisions done with huge speed. Um, huge um, uh, fanfare, uh, a lot of social media. And the reality is, the reality is it doesn't exist. It doesn't work. Uh, I can't think of a single thing that uh, Mohammed bin Salman has actually succeeded in doing. So, tiny fringe things, opening cinemas and things like that. But I, 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 can't, I can't see of a single project that has actually worked for him, unless I'm being too pessimistic, Madawi. What do you think? Well, I mean, as you said, I mean, you gave examples of uh, some sort of investment that went wrong. And I think the criteria for him is really not the viability of a project or an investment. It's the propaganda that is associated with it. So, for example, buying football uh, clubs um, or um, inviting... Um, a, you know, a world entertainment uh, authorities and enterprises into the kingdom. That seems to um, like reflect his personality. He's not looking for long-term uh, sound uh, uh, financial decisions. Um, uh, quite a lot of the things that we have seen since 2017 are really targeting um, the media hype about it because he knows it will make big news in, in the West and elsewhere if you invite a particular boxer or a, a, an entertainer. And um, this, this is what is uh, driving him. He, he, he wants to move the Saudi economy from its stagnating situation where you, know, you get uh, oil, um, uh, you know, rent, and you distribute it, oil prices go up and down, you, uh, you know, decrease your spending. When the um, uh, oil prices go up, you start you know, mythical projects. And that was the situation for over like 70, 80 years. But what he wanted to do is something different. He wanted to do something that would make him the center of attention. And he was almost like sharing the celebrity status with the entertainers, the musicians, the boxers that he, or the authority, the entertainment authority invited. So obviously there was the superstar hero of the boxing world, but behind him and even in front of him, there was the image of Mohammed bin Salman. So he, he wanted to associate himself with a completely new world of celebrity culture and hoping that that will bring a lot of money. But obviously the pandemic put a, a, a halt to all these kind of projects. And um, he's, he's left with the circus, the open circus, without actually the players in it. And now uh, his uh, uh, you know, huge portraits and, uh, and images everywhere uh, don't have the audience to cheer 
because whenever he conducted these entertainment venues, whenever there was a big event, whether it's the festival in Riyadh or the Dir'iyya festival, there was always the musician, the real celebrities in the world of popular culture, but there was also him with his sunglasses, his special jacket, and you have all the world journalists hovering and so Uh, when he when he wore it in Tin Downing uh, Street, they really celebrate it, and there is lots of songs in Saudi Arabia about it. And they celebrate; they keep celebrating these silly things, and they celebrated uh, his promises, which is completely empty promises. And there is no action in the ground, but they celebrate it. Why? Because there there is no real success to celebrate it. There is completely nothing, completely nothing. So they celebrate uh, for nothing. Uh, also regarding to the uh, corona pandemic, they celebrated uh, the government when they locked down the, the, gov the city, the country. When they locked down, they celebrated that and they said, okay, our government is the best in the world and look at what's going on to, in Europe. And uh, the numbers in Europe is uh, uh, extremely higher than Saudi Arabia. We can't know the numbers in Saudi Arabia because there is no trans transparency. Uh, also, when we compare Saudi Arabia to Europe, uh, we shouldn't compare with the number for the uh, pandemic, but we should compare with how the government are ready to face the difficulties, how many, uh, 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 for example, uh, bids in the hospitals uh, uh, regarding the percentage regarding to the population. The Saudi Arabia is one of the, is, is very low in Saudi Arabia, uh, but uh, and there is no way to compare it with Italy, but they sarcastic it uh, with the Italy with the pandemic uh, because they want to celebrate anything. They celebrated. Uh, they don't have uh, numbers like uh, Italy, and this is not in their hand. This is from the coronavirus, and we don't know the the real number. Also, uh, the financial issue. They put all the difficulties or all the things that have been like increasing the VAT and uh, these things are cut down from the from the salaries. They said that's because the coronavirus. And this is completely not true. Because our issue, as you mentioned, David, it's before the uh, coronavirus. And in the in the vision 2030, Mohammed bin Salman himself, he promised in 2020, we will not depend on the oil. But we have seen at the moment, we are depending on the oil more, more than any time before. And we are the most uh, country affected by the oil uh, crisis. Uh, they, they started the issue with the Russia, but Russia, they have another income, but we are demanding the oil. So we affected more than Russia and more than anyone else. And later on, and we know this is only decision from Hamad bin Salman, there's no experts, there's no institutions behind that. It's just the uh, one man decision. And he started the challenges with uh, Russia and we, he put us in danger and he put us in the, in the difficulties. And after that, we face the difficulties more and more with the coronavirus. And they said it's because uh, it is uh, international pandemic. It's because of the oil prices. Okay, what about your promises uh, when you said in 2020 you will not demand the oil prices? So it's very clear at the moment it is completely empty uh, promises. Thank you, Yahya. Um, so you, you've already uh, mentioned a little bit about the difficulty of speaking out mm -hmm. in Saudi Arabia and, and touched on some some of the human rights issues, um, but. Saudi Arabia have claimed that with the Vision 2030 strategy to modernize and with the kind of celebrity events and things like that that um, Madawi touched on, um, that there's also been some progress with regards to women attending football matches, women being allowed to drive, um, and then also on some human rights issues just in the last few weeks, um, flogging as a punishment has ended and the death penalty can no longer be used against minors. Um, is Vision 2030 helping to improve Saudi Arabia's human rights and its women's rights record? What, what's, what is the reality on the ground? Question for me, Rehan? Uh, yeah, um, yeah, we'll start yeah. with you. Okay, uh, regarding to the uh, reform that's called by Saudi Arabia, uh, I can't see any real reform on the ground 
The only thing that we are happy about it, they allow government to drive. But this is completely not reform because we are the last country in the world to allow women to drive. So when, when they allow women to drive, they shouldn't call it reform and they shouldn't celebrate it. They should feel shame because they banned it for all of this long time without any reason. And they should apologize for our society and for our people and say, sorry, because we ban you from something it is without any reason and free all the prisoners of conscience, especially the people they defended this right for women to drive the car. And also to pay money for people they, they uh, sized their cars because the women drove the, the cars or they put penalty for them against them in the past. They should do recover for their mistake rather than celebrate it and say it, uh, it is reform. And uh, to be honest, uh, this success, it is not from the government itself. It is from the human rights defenders, especially the women, because they defended that for a very long time and they paid the price for that. And we have seen this, uh, uh, we expected that to happen uh, during the, the time for the King Fahad, but he challenged it uh, for more time. Uh, King Abdullah, he promised several times, and we thought Abdullah he will accept it because of the international pressure and internal pressure. And Mohammed bin Salman, he came to power uh, while everything is ready to happen. And all the world was expecting uh, women to allow to drive. And this is completely not affecting the regime. So they allow it uh, finally because they are under pressure and because there is people they fought for it for a very long time. Other things like allowing men to, to go to entertainment, for example, uh, and uh, allowing opening cinema. These things, it's actually, it's not really reform because these things, it is kind of business and uh, they should put some rules for that and what they ban and what they allow and keep that between the businesses and between the society. Uh, not banning the Saudi society from the cinema one day and push them to go to, to see the cinema in Bahrain and build the bridge between Saudi Arabia to Bahrain and to allow people to go to Bahrain to see the cinemas there. And later on to open the cinema and if anyone, if anyone criticize it, they will go to prison. So the repression is available all the time. In the past, if someone asked for a cinema, they will take him to the prison. At the moment, if someone against the cinema, they will take him to the prison. At the moment, if I am against the cinema in, in UK, that's that will be fine. I will be against the cinema and they will stay at my home. If I want the cinema, I will go to the cinema and I will pay the ticket, not for the government, uh, not for the uh, Minister of the Entertainment and these things, I'll pay it for uh, the cinema company. And this, this is completely something very basic and easy, but they complicated it and they trying to use everything to, uh, to get some PR uh, from, from things it's, it's completely silly. Uh, yes, they, don't, they shouldn't buy the cinema in the past, but when they allow it, they, they should allow it and put the limitations and allow the businesses uh, uh, to start it. Uh, and we believe the real reform is to allow people to express their opinion. And we are asking the regime, if you believe the new generation, as you always mentioned, uh, uh, happy about this reform or about what Mohammed bin Salman is doing, why don't allow this generation or the people to express their opinion? Just allow them to thank you if you believe they are happy. Allow them to express their opinion. But if someone say, okay, I'm not happy about what's going on, you will go to prison. So the choices is to thank Mohammed bin Salman or to thank him. There's no other choices. So that's mean there's no real reform. People, they are not happy. If you force someone to do some, uh, something, that's mean, and you don't give him the choices, that's mean you are worried from something and you are hiding something. And this is the reality, the Saudi Arabia, they are hiding the repression. They are hiding the anger from the people. They are hiding the resistance from the people and they claim people they are happy while they are not allowing them to express their opinion freely, while they are not giving them their basic rights. Like at the moment, until now, the women rights defenders, they still imprison some of them. And some of them, they are still under uh, the trial and the, the case is still ongoing. They ban them from working just be because they ask for the normal human rights. And I can't tell you now, I have seen the court documents. Most of the crimes, if not all, against the human rights defenders, it's regarding to their uh, human rights activists. Uh, and I have seen uh, the court documents. It's exactly like CVs. They are saying they contacted 
Human Rights Watch, they contacted uh, Amnesty International, they contacted uh, the renegade Yahya Asiri and other, other people. So, uh, and they worked in this report and they uh, uh, wrote a shadow report to the Human Rights Council. So it's, it's completely like CP about their great work and they put it as a crimes. So the real reform is to allow those people to work, to do their work and to free them, but silence people and the claim there is uh, a reform this is completely something is very clear for the world if they open their eyes and try to understand what's going on in reality. Madawi, what, what has the position of uh, women in Saudi Arabia improved or worsened under King Salman and MBS? Well, it depends how you look at it. I mean, obviously, for I would say upper uh, class, middle class women who have jobs to go to, um, they're happy, for example, that they could drive and they're less dependent on drivers. But I do remember um, uh, 2011, 2013, um, and this, there was a debate about allowing women to drive. So I asked, um, I was interviewing a woman for a book uh, that I was said to her, um, uh, why don't you defend the right of women to drive? And she said, I don't care about uh, uh, driving because simply I can't afford to buy a car to drive it. So, you know, by highlighting the driving as a great achievement, we are actually obscuring the reality that not many women, uh, divorced women, women with children who are, uh, uh, you know, the main breadwinners, um, you know, if they can't afford the car, it doesn't really matter. But the debate conceals this reality of poverty, basically. <coughs> And, and Mohammed bin Salman tries to appeal to this new class, you know, the, the new sort of uh, hip hop uh, uh, characters, uh, the globe trotters, uh, the ones who are with uh, transferable skills, the internet savvy, the IT, the, the startups and all that. And then there is a whole, um, you know, section of society, especially women who are actually, you know, are happy to set up a shop in the local market and uh, sell their own homemade uh, kleja biscuits or, uh, or start a business to, to cook during Ramadan for other families. And, and those ones are not actually talked about in, in a wealthy country like Saudi Arabia. So yes, you have a class uh, educated, mostly Western educated uh, men and women and especially women who go back to Saudi Arabia and expect, you know, uh, important jobs in important companies, uh, being at the forefront uh, of, of uh, innovation and uh, entrepreneurship. But, you know, that obscures the fact that there are women uh, who are single mothers, they have a problem with absentee fathers. Um, you know, he marries one woman, well, she has children, he abandons her and goes to another city. And what is the government doing about this situation? Uh, are they um, forcing men to, to you know, uh, take responsibility for the children they spread around the country? These are the big issues that are not dealt with, neither inside Saudi Arabia in, in the public sphere or by Western media, and especially the people, the journalists who have access to Saudi Arabia. Because if they ask about these questions, if they know these questions, they'll be kicked out of the country. Um, so, you know, um, we, we see a lot of issues that are not discussed. They are completely absent from the press, from Twitter. Sometimes in social media, they erupt. Uh, but, you know, nobody wants to report about them. All we wanted to report about is women behind the wheels. And as if this is like the ultimate, uh, you know, um, the ultimate sort of prize, the ultimate reform that Mohammed bin Salman, uh, you know, hit the ceiling that he's hit. Uh, yes, it is important and it is about freedom of movement, 
But then we don't have, if, if we highlight that, then we have to keep a blind eye on these issues that I'm talking about. And, and they're not even discussed or mentioned. Um, you know, it's not these, the, the women startups, the high powered appointments that he made, whether in Majlis Ashura, the, the consultative council, or even as an ambassador in Washington, we have a women ambassador, a princess. I mean, all these are meant to, to create the celebrity status, to create the, the ambiance of the circus. But the real issues are not discussed. The real issues of, of these women uh, who are marginalized, excluded, um, you know, uh, can't afford the car. Nobody wants to talk about them. They don't even count, you know. Uh, they don't, they're not represented and their voices are not heard because simply there's nobody interested in their story or plight, basically. Um, you know, if you look at uh, charities and the great work they're doing, sometimes I wonder that Saudi society does not implode thanks to strong family uh, culture, a st a strong social networks, and the work of Islamic charities um, that had existed for generations. People give money to charity. And if you, if you look at, at the situation of this country, uh, if you have a lack of all these strong positive achievements of a society, people will be, will be actually demonstrating in the streets. A lot of young men you know, if, if you can't get a job, you stay with your father and you, and sometimes if you had married, you bring your wife and you are living off the pension of your father. I do remember during the 2008 crisis across Europe, people were horrified that their grown up children are coming back to live with them because they lost their jobs, they can't pay their mortgage. So the, the European culture didn't expect uh, the, the young men and women at age 30, 35, 40 to come back to their parents' home. But this is the norm in Saudi Arabia. You actually don't move out of your father's house unless you can afford to. And a lot of men are living uh, and women are living off uh, of the pension of their fathers. And, and this kind of situation, culturally it's accepted, but young people want to achieve you know, independence, establish their own home and marry. Uh, but the dependence on the parents is, is incredible. And so the, these social issues are not discussed in the media. All we know is that women can watch a football match and go to the stadium or they can drive a car. Uh, and now we have an, an ambassador in Washington who is, who is a woman. And so, yes, the visible signs of modernity, you know, are concealing the real struggle of many people in Saudi society. Yeah, well, I think the Western press has got a lot to, 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 to uh, be uh, shamefaced about. In particular, I don't actually blame Western journalists. I blame the structure that they arrive in. So, for example, a young uh, Western journalist at the beginning of his career, he wants to build his career. He needs access if he's a foreign correspondent. And access is mediated by the regime. So you arrive there, you are watched 24 hours, you're taken to talk to people who are the right people, and you're not given any freedom. Even at the moment when there is a kind of openness, I get journalists who are based in Riyadh, Western journalists who call me to get a balanced story, uh, to have an opinion on a story they're writing because everybody they meet is, is expected uh, to give the official narrative, even people in the street. But this is the situation in a dictatorship. So there are, I remember when the women driving was announced and women were driving in 2018, um, a, a journalist uh, in Riyadh said to me, I need to talk to you. I said, but you are in Riyadh. So talk to all those women who are enjoying the freedom to drive. She said, no, we get a, a, an official line from everybody. And we, you know, if she wants to write a balanced story and hear other voices, but she couldn't find them. People were not allowed. In fact, there was a government announcement that nobody is allowed to comment on certain issues if they are not authorized to do so. Exactly like the murder of Khashoggi, when 
the government announced that nobody has the right to talk about this crime. Uh, um, and um, you know, you will be punished if you discuss it on social media. So in this kind of context, it's very difficult to know how real reforms are being um, you know, forgotten and only the, you know, the, the uh, propaganda machine uh, allows us to, to uh, focus on very limited visible signs of a quasi-modernity, I would say. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Madawi. Um, to move on to um, a different topic, we've received quite um, a few questions on social media about the Saudi royal family. Um, David, if I can ask you um, one question that's come from Jasim in the UK, he's asked, um, is the concentration of power amongst one branch of the royal family under MBS unprecedented since 1932? If so, are there any remaining independent centers of power that dissident royals could seek to use against MBS in the future? Quite a detailed question there from Chasin. Well, the short answer is uh, yes, it is. I mean, there have been spats before uh, between various branches of the royal family, but there was always a, a, a sense of collective responsibility uh, and a system for sharing the goodies, sharing the financial wealth, and uh, in a certain sense, sharing responsibility for big decisions like foreign policy decisions. Uh, there was a mechanism for doing that. Uh, uh, you, a, an unknown prince arrives stage left uh, from a, a part of the, the uh, family. He himself wasn't particularly popular at the time. Uh, when he was a young prince, um, he only uh, uh, got to prominence through his father. And basically, he, he was one of a number of sons of his father. Uh, and, and he basically developed himself and his power as basically his chief of staff, his enforcer. He was unpopular in the family and other princes kept him waiting hours for an audience. Um, he suddenly uh, comes to power and wreaks absolute mayhem and vengeance on all the people who rejected him uh, before, uh, principally uh, by locking everyone up into hotels, uh, including several members of the royal family, including Mukhrin, uh, and uh, either roughing them up, torturing them in some cases uh, with foreign mercenaries, uh, or by threatening to and extorting large sums of money out of them. Um, that was one purge. There were there, there were lots of purges, uh, three or four. Um, the most recent one uh, was uh, against several members who uh, had influential positions in the Allegiance Council. The Allegiance Council was uh, was was invented by 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 uh, King Abdullah. He, uh, as 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 it was not. A mechanism that he himself ever used, but he wanted to set this up to, to, uh, to, um, to smooth the transition of his sons. The, 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 the main problem facing the royal family was the passing of, from one generation to another, from the from from the sons of uh, of uh, 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 of the founder of the of the nation to the next generation. And that was really where the big fight came over. And so this allegiance council was set up to represent most of the branches uh, of Abdulaziz uh, or their sons. Um, and it had certain powers and the powers of the allegiance council was uh, as an institution was to, um, to, uh, uh, to uh, approve the choice of Crown Prince and Deputy uh, 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 Crown Prince, and also to uh, um, adjudicate when the king, uh, serving king, could no longer fulfill his functions. Um, again, this is not much of an institution because it's, it really has never actually been in, been in force but um, it existed. And the latest round of arrests concerned uh, Prince Ahmed, who is the son, who is the um, uh, uh, surviving brother of uh, uh, King uh, Salman. He came back from London. He was quite open in his criticism all the time 
uh, of uh, his uh, his nephew. Uh, so he's the uncle of uh, Mohammed bin Salman, and he um, uh, openly criticised, for instance, the war in Yemen. He did not take responsibility for that. That was that that was in a rather bizarre um, confrontation with. Uh, uh, or not, not indeed a confrontation, but uh, he, he came up to speak to uh, Bahraini and Yemeni protesters outside his London home, and that went all over, uh, that, that went viral. And he has never uh, sworn allegiance to uh, Mohammed bin Salman. Obviously, lots of people said that he wanted to actually be the crown prince himself. Um, uh, he had various motives for, for, for doing that. He went back to challenge uh, Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, and the, again, one version of, of, of his return was to mount some form of opposition within the Allegiance Council. He's now under arrest, uh, as are two or three others. And so that institutional barrier has, has, has now crumbled. The, according to the rules of the game, when, for instance, uh, Mohammed bin Salman was declared Crown Prince, that should have taken place through uh, the mechanism of the Allegiance Council meeting physically in person. They didn't meet in person. They were not quarried because they didn't have uh, a chairman at the time, um, but they were contacted by telephone. And we are told that 32 out of 34 existing members uh, voted for Mohammed bin Salman. But according to their own rules, that was an illegal decision. And it's from that moment that, uh, I mean, the, the, the central paradox about Mohammed bin Salman uh, is that why would a prince who has been popularly elected by the Allegiance Council conduct one purge after another, particularly aimed at his royal family? Why would he do that if, he'd, if, if, he'd, if, if, if everyone had flocked to him in Mecca uh, on that particular night uh, when he was anointed uh, crown prince? He had the whole family in front of him. Why conduct purges aimed at his family? And I think the reason for that is because he suffers from a lack of legitimacy because he knows that, 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 that actually according to the rules of the game as they exist and they're very dysfunctional, um, he has, he, there, is, there is a huge amount of, of disquiet within the royal family uh, about him, therefore the repression. So I know I'm not sure whether you agree with me, Madawi, or, 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 or yeah, yeah, but that's my analysis of why he conducted um, the uh, one purge after another. Because in fact, he's highly insecure within the royal family itself. That doesn't mean I'm, I'm, I'm uh, somehow predicting a, a sort of uh, another palace coup against him. I think it's extremely difficult for him to, for, for, for any prince to get up. Uh, and openly challenge him without himself landing in jail and, 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 and disappearing in torture or even dying. And princes have, have died and have been killed. Uh, this is a vicious, very, very vicious dictatorship, uh, just as vicious as Pinochet uh, or indeed Mussolini. Uh, and, uh, and anyone sticking their head off the parapet, whether they're a member of the royal family or not, uh, knows exactly what will happen to them if they do. Yes, I mean, they, um, I agree with you, David. There's no, um, if, if you look at the history of the kingdom since its foundation in the 30s, that whenever there was a royal uh, rival or, or rivalry, um, you know, they, they would start agitating, then they fled the country, such as in the 1960s with the free princes. Then, you know, the, the norm had been to sort of try to get them back to come in, into the country. And this is exactly what happened from the 1960s and then Faisal, um, and then they all came back and, and there is a pardon and they are given uh, you know, um, uh, positions and opportunities to compensate them. And so this is the kind of royal politics that all Saudis are familiar with. Uh, you make a lot of noise, um, you know, and then you uh, throw some money at, at, at them and they calm down and, and stop worrying you. But with Mohammed bin Salman, it is, I think the, the problem is this, he's haunted uh, by the prospect of, uh, you know, losing legitimacy altogether, if ever he had it. And of course, a secure prince who has the support of his brothers, of his cousins and uncles, wouldn't have to go and humiliate them and purge them and, and, put, and put them in, in um, 
um, you know, hotels or um, isolation. Uh, why would he do that if, if he's secure? And they, it, there's always a narrative that, oh, it's an anti-corruption uh, drive that led to the Ritz-Carlton episode. But of course, the corruption would uh, have a wider circle if, if it is an anti-corruption uh, purge. Um, so, you know, why being selective uh, about, um, you know, uh, the princes you, you uh, put in, in, the, in the hotel and lock for a long time? And why, why also include, um, you know, some elite, financial elite that was very close to the ancien regime? So basically, he, he will continue to purge and he will continue to have these sort of episodes um, simply because he can't be secure. He can't be assured of the loyalty of his own family, members of his own family. And this is a very difficult situation you find yourself in. Um, he's probably not worried about a revolution in Saudi Arabia, but he is definitely worried about the intrigues and, and not only being active in uh, undermining his rule, but also withdrawing support is regarded as a sin and as a threat. So if you do, if you, if you sit in your house, you receive your monthly allowance as a prince, you run your own business or private company, etc. But you don't want to have too much to do with, with Mohammed bin Salman and his group. You can't be safe because that is being passive. That is being passive, withdrawing. And it is really weapons of the weak. If you can't uh, sort of, you know, um, openly uh, um, challenge Mohammed bin Salman, you can retreat into your home, into your business, etc. But now I don't think they feel secure because even being passive, not overtly praising him, will end, you, you will end up in, in, in prison and uh, you'll be suspicious. You'll be suspected of plotting something, even if you don't uh, have any, any means to do so. And I think most of the princes, even the senior ones, don't have the means to challenge him because he's concentrated so much powers in his own hand um, that he's not, um, that none of them have the, the military force to challenge him. But what they can do is withhold the oath of allegiance and that will go viral if they did, or they fail to turn up when he shows in a, in a, in a circus or in, in an event. Um, and, and therefore, I, I think what is protecting him at the moment is the fact that his father is still alive and uh, we will see what happens. And then th there will be a show that he will need every single prince to come and give him the oath of allegiance. But some people may be outside the country or pretend they, they're gonna travel or travel on purpose. They will be absent for illness or you know, uh, health reasons. And we, we know the story, how it is sort of woven around when people want to withdraw, nobody's gonna stand up and say, I refuse to give Mohammed bin Salman the oath of allegiance. They would just you know, be passive about about giving the oath of allegiance, and that would be regarded as suspicious. Yeah, here. Thank you very much. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, to summarize that, that means Mohammed bin Salman he's struggling as well. So uh, not just us struggling at the moment, not uh, uh, just the people, the society, just the people. They are struggling financially. They are struggling. Uh, from the healthcare in Saudi Arabia, it's problematic. They are struggling from the poverty, from the unemployment, uh, from the transportation in Saudi Arabia, from housing in Saudi Arabia. So in every single uh, bit in their uh, uh, life, they are struggling. And moreover, they are struggling with the repression uh, because they are afraid from everything around them. And they are talking in Saudi Arabia, they always talking about uh, the black GMC super band, uh, because they are, uh, if someone talk about anything, they said, okay, be careful from the uh, super band uh, black GMC because they will come out to take you. And uh, in Saudi Arabia, it is very uh, uh, normal to say, keep silence because the wool have ears and can hear you uh, because everyone watching, everyone listening to them and they are really afraid. So. People, they are struggling, but at the same time, 
the criticism the regime at the moment, especially against Mohammed bin Salman, it is never have been like that uh, in our history. Uh, everyone at the moment, they criticize Mohammed bin Salman. Yes, he paid large amount of money for the PR and he success with the PR in the beginning. But uh, at the end, he lost everything and every, everyone around the world, they know he is not just a dictator, but a dictator and failure. Uh, lots of failure in his life. Uh, so he, he lost a lot uh, uh, and he led us at the end to the, uh, to the uh, I can say maybe, uh, lose-lose situation between all of us. And we will continue a lose-lose situation unless if you want to do real reform. If he do uh, a real reform, that will protect some of our rights and that will give him some survive for the future. Yes, we don't want to uh, give survive for the repression and for the dictator regime, but we don't want to have a, a sudden collapse in one day. And this is what he's leading us to at the moment. Uh, if he do uh, a reform allowing people to participate in their country, to build their country uh, and to allow them to express their opinion, to free the prisoner of conscience and to give some political, uh, political reform that will give him some hope, that will give him uh, some opportunity to continue and will allow it inside the country. At the moment, it is so difficult for all of us, uh, for the people, for the royal family, for Mohammed bin Salman himself, for everyone. Thank you, Yahya. Um, we're running a bit short on time, so I'm going to uh, move into the very last round of questions. And, and if you can keep your answers brief for these questions, um, that would be great. We've received quite uh, a few questions about the kind of wider geopolitical implications of some of MBS's policies and some of his alliances. Um, David, um, we've seen in recent years um, Saudi has actually turned against um, some of its former Arab and former Muslim allies, such as Qatar, such as Turkey. Um, Saudi criticized an Islamic summit that was organized by Malaysia. Um, and it's also been accused of kind of giving up on, on the Palestinian cause and normalizing relations with Israel. Um, why do you think it is that, that Saudi um, have, have kind of gone ahead with these stances and? and people feel that they're um, alienating its Arab and Muslim allies? Well, this started with the, the very way in which um, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, the unknown prince, uh, came to power. Uh, he was very, very much advised in this by uh, Mohammed bin Zayed, the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, who was the guy who gave him all the technology to introduce him, to this unknown prince, to, to the White House. And one of the first bits of advice a long way back was, if you want to get uh, uh, into comfortable relations with the president of the United States, you have to go by Israel. And um, that's exactly what he did. Um, Israel, for its own reasons, has now benefits from the support of Saudi Arabia. I once got denounced by the Saudi ambassador in London for saying this, but it's actually true. Um, uh, that they've received a lot of support from Saudi Arabia uh, during the last attack on uh, Gaza, for instance, um, but in, in, in a wider context. Um, and Saudi Arabia, for its part, but particularly MBS, has been one of the messages that he's been putting across specifically on social media um, and, and, and through, uh, there, was a, there was a television drama called Exit 7. Uh, that was a, another example of this where they put specifically new messages into the mouths of actors, um, which had uh, a, uh, the actually the opposite effect on, on Saudi opinion. Of course, it, it doesn't work, but basically it is to abandon the Palestinian cause. Um, and this is immensely helpful for Israel because uh, they're just about to announce plans to annex a very big chunk of the West Bank. Um, and if they've got Saudi Arabia on their side, uh, suppressing um, uh, Saudi opinion, that, 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 that's a huge help. Um, this, of course, is incredibly pro pro problematic in, in regional uh, Arab context, because one of the mechanisms for, uh, for, for, I mean, Saudi Arabia was always very, very balanced. It was balanced. It was, there was a thing called the Mecca summit, which was supposed to be a reconciliation between Fatah and Hamas. 
um, it, 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 it had a very, very balanced view. It wasn't sectarian about the, the Palestinian uh, um, cause. It, 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 it wasn't based on one particular current uh, of, of Palestinian resistance. Uh, it supported the PA, it funded the PA. Um, it, it had an extremely sensible uh, uh, view about uh, the solution, which is based on a two-state solution. I don't believe that now is on the agenda anymore, but um, it, it backed uh, sensible, moderate uh, plans to share the land. Um, and it's abandoned that uh, whole um, uh, uh, position, which was actually a very good position to have in, in the favor of, as Madawi said, of very narrow uh, objectives, get, get very close to, uh, the, um, to the president of the White House, get close to the, the Zionist lobby, uh, to say that Palestinians should really become good Jews. This is another thing that uh, Mohammed bin Salman said on, 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 on his trip to, to, and it's just shocked everyone, it's just shocked the pin. And peace doesn't lie like that. There is no way in which you can have a, an end to that conflict by basically saying that Palestinians should accept the money and go home. It's not going to work. Even if you wanted that to happen, it's just simply not going to work. There's no one I know who knows that, for instance, the, the deal of the century is going to work. It's a complete non-start of the plan, but they need uh, they, they need Saudi support for that. The reason I say this is highly problematic, that I've just talked about the Palestinian conflict, is because Jordan, if, if, if one of the parts of that plan is to, to replace uh, uh, um, uh, Jordan as, as one of the custodians, or the custodian of the holy sites, Christian as well as Muslim, in, 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 in Jerusalem with Saudi Arabia, there's suggestions of their maneuverings behind it, you're basically... Um, uh, starting a war with the Hashemites. And the Saudis and the Hashemites do not have a very uh, good history of getting on with each other, as Madami knows only too well, much better than me. So, so there are lots and lots of problems attached to changing the furniture, changing the sponsorship, changing the changing arrangements which, uh, which, which, which have been uh, around. And peace doesn't lie uh, by getting rid of the Palestinian problem, getting rid of the refugee problem, and then getting rid of, 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 of Jordan. What, what happens then is, 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 is that you, you're having conflict on your eastern and longest border, as far as Israel is concerned. So um, uh, as, as far as uh, this, this, was a, this was basically a pact with the devil, and um, this is, uh, and it's not gonna work, but it, what will happen, of course, is that Israel will uh, annex anyway, um, and that uh, uh, more uh, a new generation of uh, of Palestinians will 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 be radicalized as a result, um, and uh, um, it's, it's it's a highly dangerous situation. But it's also very very bad for Saudi Arabia itself because Saudi Arabia exerted quite a lot of soft power and influence. Uh, 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 in the Arab world by having a balanced foreign policy. It's rejected all of that. It's privatized its foreign policy uh, uh, to, to, to uh, and, and it's become reckless and, it, and it's done things like uh, start a war in Yemen and not being able to finish or, 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 or stop it. And in, 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 in that sense, uh, its regional enemies have, have uh, grown more powerful um, as, as a result. Um, I think in terms of the Islamic world, Saudi Arabia has lost a lot of respect. Uh, particularly, we started our conversation with the, you know, with the, with the closure of Umrah. Um, there were problems way before that with the visas that, uh, that, that, that it gave out uh, for, for, for pilgrims, uh, causing lots and lots of problems in Jordan. There were demonstrations on the streets of Amman. Um, against the prices being charged for that. So very briefly, um, in foreign policy, Saudi Arabia has lost a lot of what was a really quite a powerful position. Thank you, David. Um, Madawi, um, if social media is anything to go by, it would seem that there's thousands, if not millions of Saudis who are very suspicious of Qatar, of, of Erdogan in Turkey, and who believe that Palestinians are ungrateful for Saudi support. 
just a few weeks ago, pa Palestine is not my cause was top trending uh, on Saudi Twitter. Um, is this the reality on the ground in Saudi Arabia? No, I can't uh, think that this um, uh, measures uh, public opinion in Saudi Arabia. But as David said, there is a shift in general when it comes to regional or uh, Islamic uh, policy. Um, for several decades, Saudi Arabia play a sort of um, position in the world was actually based on two premises. One of them was Islam and the other one was oil. Uh, so oil was important for the West, but also Islam because Saudi Arabia used Islam to, to sort of pursue the policies of Western government at one point in the 1950s and 1960s, whereby Islam became a counter force against what was regarded as subversive, leftist, anti-imperialist, uh, nationalist, I, uh, ideologies. So now uh, I think they think that they've done the job. Um, oil is no longer important for, let's say, the US in general. And in Europe, and in, uh, there is a drive to search for alternative uh, sources, etc. Uh, so the global oil market has changed. But then what happened to Islam? in the Muslim world now, and also the position that Saudi Arabia took with regard to the Palestinian cause. Mohammed bin Salman first premise or promise, I would say to uh, Trump is that this is not gonna be the main issue. And we are going to abandon that focus on Islam and our responsibilities towards the Muslim world. And from that, he, he got the full sort of approval from Trump. But one thing when, when the Saudi put new position on the Palestinians, which is in general very, very negative, and it is negative as long as it infiltrates social media, obviously. Um, um, one thing that is so clear that if Saudi Arabia wants to pursue diplomatic relations with Israel for its own purposes, and for shared common interests, that is, you know, against Iran, et cetera. Mohammed bin Salman wouldn't dare do that uh, simply because the price will be very high and there will not probably be a Saudi Arabia or a kingdom of Saudi Arabia if should he have an Israeli flag in Riyadh very soon. But he realizes that there is a problem there and what he's doing is preparing the, the public to accept this narrative that you, you see on Twitter, that the Palestinians are responsible for their own fly, uh, plight, that they're the cause of their own uh, uh, you know, problems, that we need to dissociate ourselves from any kind of Palestinian issues and pursue our interests. And they, the regime has enlisted intellectuals, uh, professional writers, journalists, even entertainment, uh, and 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 sort of you know uh, television series in order to push a particular message. So yes, relations with Israel exist, and there are uh, uh, studies about how economically, financially, and in terms of security and military. Uh, they do have uh, relations and they do cooperate. And this is not new. This is not the work of Mohammed bin Salman. It has existed before Mohammed bin Salman. However, even if Mohammed bin Salman delivers the peace uh, uh, plan that Kushner, Trump want, it doesn't mean that on the ground the Palestinian issue will just disappear. Saudi Arabia is no longer a key a uh, negotiator, a key player in solving other countries' problem or other or mediating between countries in the region. It is so uh, biased and so, uh, um, you know, uh, 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 impartial. It is not a negotiator that maintains equal distance from two groups that are at the negotiating table. And therefore, they can never play a role. 
uh, David kept referring to the Mecca conferences where in the past they claimed that they wanted to bring the Sunni and the Shia in Iraq together. They used the symbolism of Mecca to, to uh, sort of uh, start a reconciliation, a reconciliation after 2003. Then they had Hamas and uh, PLO coming to Mecca because King Abdullah at the time wanted to have a reconciliation. But we see that all of these kind of initiatives have failed. Uh, and you know, Saudi Arabia is no longer looked for, especially under the current leadership, as an epicenter of uh, of Arab or Islamic, uh, uh, you know, solidarity. And they have seen through their own policies, the regime policies, how other countries have taken the lead. I mean, like Turkey now, Turkey mediates um, and in and and is plays a part in the region's politics from Syria to Northern Iraq, to Qatar, to Libya and other places. And uh, people keep talking about uh, the America retreating from the world. And we, we see actually its client state, namely the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, also retreating from exerting any kind of influence in the world. And, and that's, that's the sad situation for the Saudi regime. Uh, it doesn't command that kind of respect. Yes, Muslims look for Mecca and Medina and the place as a holy place, but they have no respect for, for the leadership. Especially if you're talking about Asian Muslims, who there are thousands and thousands of them in, in a country like Saudi Arabia. They see the racism. They see now that they are the greatest casualty in the pandemic. And the people who are crammed the workers, the immigrant workers who are crammed in unhygienic, overcrowded uh, uh, rooms, they are the ones who are suffering as a result of the pandemic. And they are the ones who are deported um, uh, to their countries. They have no rights there. So the people, the Muslims who initially look for Saudi Arabia as the place of Islam, the rise of Islam, when they go and visit, they have second thoughts, especially if they are immigrant workers. Um, and, and that changes their attitude towards the country, but doesn't obviously change their attitude towards their religion, their, their worship, their rituals. They always will want to go to Saudi, to Saudi Arabia. They want to go to Mecca and Medina to perform an uh, important pillar of, of their faith. But in terms of the politics of the place, they detest it. And they are beginning to lose their allies among, uh, um, you know, um, Muslim countries simply because they've exported to them a certain kind of Islam that didn't really fit in with the local cultural tradition of Muslims in India, Muslims in Pakistan, Muslims in Malaysia, Indonesia. These were this is where the critical mass of Muslims are. They're not in Saudi Arabia. You know, I mean, like 20 million Muslims in Saudi Arabia compared to you know uh, uh, the Muslims in India or Indonesia other countries, but you know, the, the sovereignty of Saudi Arabia over Mecca and Medina gave it in the past some kind of aura, some kind of respect and a mystique. But Muslims, when they have a real experience of what it's like to be an immigrant worker in Saudi Arabia, they do have uh, second thoughts, I think. Thank you for that, Madari, really, really insightful. Yeah, yeah, if we, if we can finish um, with you, uh, we've had uh, a question on social media from Mahmoud um, in the UK uh, about Qatar. He says, um, it's been three years um, since the blockade uh, on Qatar. Could the impact of the pandemic bring the nations, Saudi Arabia and Qatar closer? And also any other wider thoughts you have on this discussion about Saudi Arabia and its relations with its Muslim and Arab allies? Yep. Uh I don't think the pandemic will affect the relation with Qatar because there is lots of things is more uh, important and affected uh, the politics in Saudi Arabia. And we thought that will lead to solve the issue and uh, to end the blockade on Qatar, but that's not happened uh, basically because Saudi Arabia, they don't have a strategic uh, thinking about what's going on. And they are uh, having this unstable relation in the region and also in the world, basically because the foreign strategy or foreign uh, attitude from Saudi Arabia 
it's built in in wrong base. Uh, in the past, Saudi Arabia, they used to have the relations with uh, or built uh, uh, the relation with the allies. Uh, they depend on the money, not depend on the ethics or ideologies or uh, with the interest as well. Uh, it's just on the money. Uh, poor country, they pay them as aid and uh, uh, trying to help them uh, financially or with the military like in Bahrain uh, and big country they are trying to have them as allies with the contracts and arm deal and big contracts so all of these relations it's uh, money talk and uh, if there is an issue with the oil or if there is financial issue they will lose uh, they will lose all the, their allies and uh, they have not uh, smartly used they are uh, the center for Islamic country and the center in the, in the Arab world, they have not uh, able to use that and they have not uh, been able to build good allies with also with the Gulf states or in the region. So uh, the issue, it's not just internal with their people, but also in the, in the, in the region, uh, it's unstable at the moment. And the stability that the Western allies looking for in the region is not available at the moment, Saudi Arabia not just having an issue with Yemen, but issue with Yemen, with, uh, Yemen, uh, with Qatar, uh, issue with Qatar, with Yemen, with Turkey, with Iran, with Syria, with Palestine as well, uh, and with uh, Turkey, with Canada, uh, with uh, Norway, with Finland, with Germany, uh, and also the relation with the United States is not the best. They have good relation with Donald Trump, uh, but with the institutions inside uh, uh, United States, we have the, we have seen lots of issues, including the FBI and uh, the issue uh, for uh, the recording about the story for Jamal, the murder for Jamal Khashoggi, uh, and the world at the moment they know to be a lie with Saudi Arabia. You need to pay price, not just uh, getting uh, good contracts with them or getting aid from them, but also you need to pay price. And we have seen the allies at the moment, Saudi Arabia. They put their allies in very, very difficult situation. If you look, for example, for the biggest allies for Saudi Arabia, United States or Donald Trump, Donald Trump is not in the best situation when he defends um, Mohammed bin Salman. He's paying bribes. And people inside the United States and institutions in the United States, they always criticize uh, Donald Trump because he's trying to cover up the stories or the crimes from Mohammed bin Salman. So he's not in the best situation when he defends Mohammed bin Salman. This is the big allies. And when we look for small allies like Bahrain, for example, or Yemen, uh, the, the, the government for Hadi, uh, the government for Hadi, they are like in prison, controlled by Saudi Arabia. And Bahrain, for example, they don't have any decision. They just uh, echoing, uh, echo for Saudi Arabia. So nobody wants to be in this situation. And if there is no difficulties with countries like uh, uh, Jordan and Morocco, they will not be aligned with Saudi Arabia. And if there is uh, real pressure from inside the Western uh, governments uh, or the Western countries, uh, they will not be aligned for Saudi Arabia. So uh, they built their relations, foreign relation in wrong uh, placement. And that will not continue, especially with the oil prices and the oil issues. Thank you, Yahya. I think that brings us to the end of the discussion, unless Madawi or David have any final thoughts that they're dying to say. No, I think we've covered a lot of ground. I, th I think we have, yes. Um, it's been, been a really, really interesting, insightful discussion. Thank you to everyone who's watched, everyone who asked questions, and of course, to our, to our three panelists um, for contributing. David, have you got any, any last no, it was a very good discussion. I learned a lot and thanks so much for Madawi and for you here to uh, give up your time on this. That's great. Thank you. Great. Yeah, thank you very um, much, all of you. Thank you. I think that, that brings um, today's discussion to an end and we look forward to um, everyone watching, joining us again for future editions um, of, of Talking Points. Um, yeah.